Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Tavi, for the nice introduction, and uh, thanks for everyone for coming here. And uh, it's uh, it's pretty my honor to be here to share uh, my experience about uh, contrastive learning. So I think contrastive learning is a general self-supervised learning approach. Uh, so before diving into contrastive learning, so I will just uh, recap about a uh, supervised image classification. So given I Im input image X, a learner typically neural networks are tries to are trying to predict its semantic class, which here is a cat. And such learner is typically updated by calibrating its output with human annotating labels Y. Uh, in many tasks, the such label can be expensive or sometimes can just be invisible. So instead, self-supervised learning approach tries to automatically generate some labels from the data without human uh, annotators. And, uh, and you have already, maybe probably you have been familiar with the Loquen's uh, analogy cake, where it thinks that the reinforcement learning is a cherry on top of the cake, which has a few information bits to guide your learner. And uh, um, the supervised learning is the icing layer, which has somewhat more information bits for, for the supervision. But self-supervised learning might be the cake layer, which has millions of uh, information bits there. So in other words, the input data contains abundant information and why don't we just let the data itself to supervise the learning process? And the previous uh, self-supervised learning approach can roughly be divided into non-contrastive approach as well as a contrastive approach. For non-contrastive approach, there are some lead ideas there, such as uh, predict the image inventing or uh, predict uh, the colorization or just predict the rotation uh, degree of the image. Such ideas are lead, but you can see that it's kind of uh, some random guess inside of the methodology space. So there is an, a, not a clear collection between those approaches. But for contrastive learning approach, it's just a more principled general approach, which I will uh, detail in later uh, slides. But here you probably have noticed that I put the ASO of contrastive approach a little bit higher than that of the non-contrastive approach. So in my opinion, I think a contrastive approach is somewhere between just purely rely on specific data type and uh, the supervised approach. So actually, and uh, I think contrastive learning has uh, both a uh, self-supervised and a supervised interpretation. Um, we will uh, dive it in, into it uh, later. So now let's take a look at the uh, self-supervised uh, uh, image representation benchmark. Uh, this is typically conducted on ImageNet. And uh, typically a network is pre-trained with a pre-text task where the label is automatically generated from the data uh, as we articulated before. And after the pre-training stage, we typically freeze the network and train a linear classifier on top of the representation to perform image classification. And of course, this is not a perfect uh, measure, but somewhat it can tell us how linearly separable the learning representations are. And uh, here is a set of non-contrastive approaches here. And you can see that we are making steady progress over the past few years. But if you do extrapolation of this progress, we might need another 20 years to catch up what we have today with the supervised learning approach. And uh, in the year of 2018, uh, contrastive approach jumps in and it uh, it improves the state of the art very significantly. And as a reminder, we know that the ResNet 50, uh, supervised ResNet 50 can only give you about 76% uh, top one accuracy on ImageNet benchmark. So you can see constructive learning really pushes the, the state of the art of uh, unsupervised representation learning. So therefore, we will be focused on constructive learning approach today. Uh, so now 
what is contrastive learning? Actually, the core idea of contrastive uh, representation learning is pretty simple. As we can see in the example here, uh, the idea is just, is just trying to pull in together similar data pairs, which is often called positive pairs, while at the same, same time, we will push away negative pairs, negative data, dissimilar data pair, which, we, which here is, uh, um, which is also called uh, negative pairs, yeah. And uh, there are actually uh, three different uh, uh, ways to do the constructive learning, maybe even more, but the very first one is proposed uh, in CVPR 2006, where a margin is used to separate uh, similar data pairs and dissimilar data pairs, where we hope that uh, the distance of similar pairs should fall inside some, uh, some margin, while the distance of dissimilar pairs should go beyond that margin. And another way to do this is uh, triplet loss, where we hope that a positive data should be closer to, uh, to the anchor point uh, than the negative data. And also, you may include some margin in the triplet loss, but typically the uh, triplet loss involves harder example mining, which can sometimes be painful. And the third one is also the most widely used one is the K-pair loss, so, uh, which is proposed in Europe 2016. So uh, for each positive pair, it will use K negative pairs for the contrasting purpose. So let's, uh, uh, now let's take a look at the key pair contrastive loss that is uh, widely used recently. So without the loss of generality, let's just assume that we have two variables, X and Y, and we have access to a set of paired, paired examples. So construction of such paired data set can be very common in practice. So for example, the X can be the video, and Y can be its corresponding audio. And or we can also leverage the co-occurrence of image and texts. Or uh, to some extreme, we can use X and Y to be different augmentations of the same image. So in this example here, we assume that uh, X3 we know is the anchor point from the X side. And we, we know Y3 is its corresponding positive on the Y side and all other y's are negatives. But uh, uh, in, a, in a full batch contrastive learning, we can include all of those y's inside one single batch, but that can be difficult if the uh, n is very large for y, for example, an image data, data set. Then what people typically does is do a subsampling. So instead of using all of the y's, we keep using Y3 as positive. At the same time, we just sample, subsample another K negatives from the data set. And this results in the following contrastive loss. The idea is pretty simple. It's just uh, the, the formula is also very similar to, to most of us. And it's just a softmax cross entropy loss. So the idea is just uh, given the anchor point X3, we want to pick the corresponding Y3 out of out from a lot of distractors using uh, the softmax uh, formulation. Now let's uh, then let's take a look at the image contrastive representation learning. So for most of the state of the art methods, the just the leverage data augmentation is to create the X and Y pair. So in this figure, given an image, two independent augmentations are created. And they are further fed into the convolutional neural network to extract the representation, latent features. And uh, you may sometimes have a, a further projection layer to project the feature in a lower dimensional space. And then the contrastive loss uh, repair, repair representations uh, of crops from different images while it, uh, the representations of crops from the same images are attracted. Uh, the challenge in contrastive learning is actually that you, have, you need to have a large number of negatives. So as shown in this example, you can, uh, actually the x-axis is uh, in the log scale, so you can really see that uh, 
as you increase the number of negatives, the performance of the downstream task increases significantly. So then the challenge is here you can see that we might need 16K negatives uh, for contrast, contrastive learning. So the challenge is how to include such a large number of negatives for each example inside of your batch training. There are actually three different methods. And uh, uh, I just um, sort, of, sort of them here by the ISO of time. So the first uh, approach is uh, memory back. And uh, it was proposed in uh, the instance discrimination paper, which in my opinion is the open chapter of uh, modern contrastive representation learning. And uh, uh, this approach is leverages a cache, as you can see here, a memory back called memory back. It stores the features of the whole data set. Now, given an image, we first augment it and we extract its video features xi as the first view. For the second view, because we know the index of the image inside of the data set, it's i, so we can go to the memory back and retrieve its features over there and to form the yi. And at the same time, we can also sample large number of negative directly from the memory back without computing the feature exactly. And then we perform a contrastive loss. And after we perform a contrastive loss, we will put the XI into the memory back to update the memory back. But as probably you have been noticed that uh, each feature inside the memory back will only be updated once per epoch, which means that uh, the distribution of the features might have been changed uh, um, between the very first example and the very last example in the memory back. Um, so that is some staleness of the feature. And to overcome that, this paper proposed some moment update in the feature. So, in, so that means instead of di directly overwriting the feature in the memory back, you just uh, do some linear combination of them. So here in this example, the parameter alpha is just 0 0.5. And so in this way, the feature distribution in the memory back is more stable there, so that uh, you can still do contrastive learning stably. Uh, but one drawback you probably notice that is uh, the space complexity of the memory back is on, which can be sometimes be uh, infeasible if we have a very large data set. And you need to put that memory back inside of uh, on the CPU or GPU. But uh, uh, for uh, larger data sets, that might be infeasible. So, uh, so there comes the second approach, momentum encoder, which is called the MoCo. Uh, this approach is proposed to overcome both the staleness of uh, features in the memory back uh, as well as the, as well as its high spatial complexity. So instead of using a memory back that uh, goes all in with the size of the data set, Moco uses a fixed size cache here. So now, because it doesn't store the feature of all images, now we cannot retrieve, retrieve the feature of a given image from the memory back. So instead, we will also have another encoder uh, to encode another crop of the image to generate the second view. So instead of retrieval from the memory back, now we now have to do a forward pass to extract the feature. And then the features inside the queue, uh, which are computed from previous batches, are used as negatives for the contrastive learning purpose. And uh, um, after we conduct the contrastive learning, we will enqueue the current batch, we will put the current batch into the queue and dequeue the earliest batch. So in that case, the length of the queue is just fixed. And, uh, um, and uh, but you can still think that the, 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 the second encoder, if we use the second encoder the same as the first encoder, the distribution of the features inside of the queue can still be uh, non-stationary. So we can probably can not do that. So the idea, is a MoCo is 
rather simple. So instead, instead of like the memory back, you put the momentum in the feature update. So here in Moco, you put the momentum update in the encoder. That means the second encoder is just the exponential movement average of the first encoder. And so you can see the collection between the previous uh, uh, memory back paper and the Moco paper. It's, it's very neat to switch from a, a, a memory back to such a queue, which has a fixed length. So in this case, you can really scale Moco uh, approach to really large data set without increasing this, the size, the spatial size. Uh, the next approach uh, is uh, just uh, leverage large batch uh, if you are Google. Uh, so here, same clear comes. So of course, there are still some, uh, some technical novelty in the same clear paper, but to me, the biggest change is uh, the inter-batch contrastive learning, which is kind of straightforward if you have enough computational resources. And uh, yes, uh, typically they use a uh, batch size of 4K or 16K or, or 8K. Yeah. But we don't mention that actually for each image, they will have two different crops and forward them twice, forward uh, each image twice inside each batch. So it's pretty large. Um, another line of, of approach, which also, tech, in my opinion, tackling the uh, insufficiency of negatives is uh, uh, contrastive predictive coding at uh, AMDIM, where the idea is very neat and they just uh, leverage local features instead of using global features. So for example, in the AMDIM here, you can treat uh, uh, the global feature of one, one augmented image as the first view, and for the while for the second view, you can also have another crop and extract the features, but instead of using the global features, you're using some kind of local features so that you can pair a lot of positive pairs inside of one single image. And at the same time, the negative pairs are also incre increased significantly because you can use local features from other images to form the negative pair. And uh, therefore, the number of negative um, negatives inside one single batch is amplified by a factor of H multiplied W, where H and W is the spatial size of your local feature map. It can be just the last the second feature, convolutional feature layer, or last the third, as you like. So you can see all these approaches are trying to tackle in the problem of how to include a large number of negatives uh, uh, for each example. So uh, another night of, uh, uh, I think, uh, while those approaches are tackling the number, different number of negatives, want to increase the number of negatives, uh, I and my co-authors, Dinip and Philip here, uh, think of from another orthogonal perspective. So namely, instead, we want to consider how to construct views beyond just data augmentation. Actually, the reason that pushes us to think this, this way is that uh, the question that what information bits are important in the data. So like in the traditional approach, autoencoder, every bit is equally important. And we hope the literal representation can capture all information bits stored in the data by enforcing a reconstruction loss. But maybe but we hypothesize that some information bits are more important than others because we want to throw away some nuisance factors and keep semantic information bits. So what information bits are important in an unsupervised way? So we believe that uh, maybe the nature have done the selection for the us. So we believe that information bits that are shared by multimodality are tend to be more important. So for example, when we step into a Zoom, we can we might directly see the dog inside the Zoom, or maybe we can hear the dog is shouting there, or maybe we can just smell um, smell the dog there. So in this case, what matters is important is the information bit of dog, just dog. But uh, 
the camera, uh, uh, the, the viewpoint of the camera or the background uh, uh, nuisance inside the image are not important at all. So therefore, we want to do constructive learning over different views of the data such that uh, we can emphasize on information bits that are shared across different views. So here is an example here. Uh, for, for, for image representation, I mean, actually we just have one modality, but we just do it manually here. We split the image over into luminance and uh, chrominance and do contrastive learning over the two views. And of course, we will have a different encoder for each view. And interestingly, we found that uh, even inside the image representation learning task, we found that this cross view contrastive learning outperforms when the model contrastive learning, like outperforms the uh, instance discrimination in a header to header comparison. Using all mechanisms, all the same mechanisms and all the same training recipe. And another example is that we also try some idea in the video space where we can treat the RGB image as one view. And at the same time, we can treat the optical flow as the other view. And we also found it gives us very decent performance using the same uh, exactly same network compared with previous works. And another nice thing is that actually we can go beyond two views. We may sort each information bits by the number of views containing it. So information bits that are shared by most of the views should be more important than information bits that are only shared by one or two views. So here in this example, we consider, in, in addition to considering luminance and chrominance images, we also consider semantic segmentation map and a uh, um, depth image and a surface normal as well. So we perform contrastive learning uh, over all of these views. And uh, the nice thing is that we found as we increase the number of views uh, here, the representation quality of each view, each single view gets improved. So it's a very uh, nice trend here. Um, and actually, contrastive much view learning can be a very, uh, in my opinion, can be a general uh, approach where uh, you can go beyond the luminance and chrominance images, RGB and optical flow. Just the concept of a multi view can be very general. It can be just uh, any uh, physical projection of the underlying world, and as long as you have some co occurring data. So, here are some further examples. So, in this example, uh, the authors use the visual data as one view and the corresponding audio data as another view. The authors try to compare the cross modal contrastive learning with Winsor modal contrastive learning. So for Winsor modal contrastive learning, they do contrastive learning for visual data and audio data separately. So there is no collection between these two modality. And as they compare between these two methods, they found that actually the cross modal contrastive learning significantly outperforms the Winsor modal contrastive learning. And other examples can be just uh, your leverage visual data and texture data. And also you might be, you can also treat uh, one uh, linguistic, linguistic language as one view and uh, another language as uh, another view as known as the meaning is paired there. Uh, so given those examples of multi-view contrastive learning, uh, then one question pops up to um, be Philippe at Dineb, so at, uh, uh, at other courses. So we are trying to think what are good views for contrastive learning. Um, so to answer this question, I think we will take a look at the mutual information interpretation of contrastive learning. So suppose we extract two views here, V1 and V2, from the complete data tensor X. So here, we use the image as an example, but again, the X can be very general. It can be uh, just a union of multiple modality data. So, okay, then we can think of the positive pairs uh, samples from the joint distribution of the two variables, while negative pairs are samples from the product of marginals of these two distribution. And so contrastive learning is therefore trying to separate in uh, the joint distribution from the product of marginals, which uh, has a natural collection with uh, um, mutual information. 
So, so, so previous work have actually showed that um, minimizing the contrastive noise is equivalent to maximize the lower bound on the mutual information between V1 and V2. So that means you are trying to uh, squeeze all the mutual information bits between the V1 and V2 into the latent representation. And actually such a lower band is defined as the influence E band. And so uh, then we want to leverage this tool to see how contrastive learning is connected with mutual information and how mutual information matters in uh, for different downstream tasks. So now let's get back to the question. What are good views for downstream task? So without loss of general energy again, so we assume there we have a downstream task whose ground truth label is Y. Then we may come uh, up with uh, two views of sum. The first view is that uh, we know that uh, contrastive learning leverages and extracts information bits between the two views, between the shared two views. So therefore, we hope that each view will contain all information that X has about the label Y. So in other words, task relevant information should be intact in both views. So in this way, the contrastive learning can leverage that information and squeeze that information into your latent representation. And at the same time, we want to, uh, because we know that uh, the contrastive learning just maximize mutual information between V1 and V2, at the same time, we want to remove task relevant information uh, between the two views. This can be done by minimizing the mutual information. So uh, these two zoos actually forms our informing principle. So it's pretty, the idea is uh, uh, pretty simple. It's just the one to keep all task relevant information between these two views while move away all nuisance factors because of those new, because those new nuisance factors can make your representation less generalizable and uh, sensitive to some noise. And to say uh, uh, a complete proof of uh, these two zoos, please refer to the paper there. We have some proof in the, com uh, in the appendix. So to get a better picture of how view selection could affect the uh, transferring performance as a downstream task, we consider gradually um, increasing the mutual information between the two views of V1 and V2. So starting from uh, zero here, Actually, there are multiple ways to fill in information bits, information bits between the two views. For example, we, we might fill in uh, the task relevant information first, and then task irrelevant information, or the reverse order, or we can even do uh, something in between, just uh, fill in both of them at the same time. But uh, here, let's consider an optimal way. So where we firstly fill in uh, task relevant information bits, which is also signal. And after that, we fill in uh, task irrelevant information. So at the very beginning, uh, you can see, as we increase the number of information bits, it will touch a boundary here. So the blue line here is uh, the total information bits, your data x has about y. So task relevant information is as much as i x y. You cannot uh, go beyond that because that's all the data has. And after you fail to this degree, if you, keep one, if you keep increasing the mutual information between V1 and V2, what you can add is only task relevant noise. And you, so you will have ex excessive noise here. So under some hypothesis, we can infer, we can try to have a guess of a transferring performance here. So there are two stages actually. At the very beginning, there is not enough signal. You just keep increasing signal, you get a better downstream performance. And after you fill in uh, all the information, so here actually the signal noise uh, ratio can be just inf infinite. There is no noise, but you have complete uh, signal here. And uh, later on, you will keep adding noise, which uh, will harm your generalization performance. So then you will save a performance drop. So, this optimal case actually indicates a reverse U-shape about the uh, reverse U-shape about the transferring performance. 
um, and it also uh, indicates that actually the uh, the optimal views for are uh, actually task independent for different uh, downstream tasks because the different downstream tasks have different y here, right? Um, well, uh, okay, so one point I want to also mention here is that uh, this figure tells us if the two views share too much mutual information, that's bad, you will get a poor transferring performance. So to construct good views, you might just uh, reduce the mutual information between the views while you keep, at the same time, you just keep the task relevant information intact. So, so while the key boils down to control the mutual information between the two views, um, in most of the scenarios, actually, we don't know what the downstream task is beforehand. So the question is, can we still blindly reduce the mutual information between the two views to get more effective uh, views? And the answer turns out to be yes. And he here is an example of controlling mutual information by uh, controlling the distance of um, different patches inside one single image. So in this example here, we use two different patches inside one image as the positive pair, and we carefully control their distance here. So as you can imagine that if we separate the two patches uh, far away, the mutual information should be decreased. And if we put them close, they will have high mutual information. And this can be also seen in this curve. So here the number uh, on top of each point means how far away the two patches are. As you can see that uh, if the patches are very close to each other, the, the mutual information here is it's not just mutual, it's not real mutual information, but it's the NCE bound, the NCE estimate of the mutual information. You can see that when the two patches are close to each other, the mutual information is high. And to our surprise that when the two patches are close, they are just the close corner by corner here. Then, uh, the performance is the worst. As we gradually increase the distance between them, the downstream task performance firstly improves and then drops. So this follows, just follows the reverse view shape as we seen in previous uh, uh, slide. And another example is just can be um, color spaces. We know that actually different color spaces split information in different ways. Here um, we also we can here we can try with different kind of space to see how much information is changed between the kind of spaces. So what we do here is uh, given a three-channel kind of space, we will use its first channel as the one view, and the remaining the remaining two channels as the second view, and perform the contrastive learning. So here uh, we all also observe that. Blindly reduce the mutual information between the two views can lead to the improvement of accuracy for the downstream task. But different from the reverse U shape in previous slides, we didn't see the performance drop stage. I think it's just because uh, for natural color space, we cannot reduce the mutual information furthermore. So the limit is somewhere like the YDVDR color space, which is a luminous chrominance decomposition. And another widely used way is actually data augmentation, uh, which also requires, uh, which actually also reduces mutual information uh, between different independent, independent augmentation of the same image. So here we try to consider some example here. Uh, we will consider two examples. And the first example is color jittering. And there is a parameter magnitude to control uh, the color jittering magnitude of the, uh, the underlying image. And as we can see that if we, we increase, increase the magnitude here, the mutual information between different augmentations of the same image will be uh, reduced. And you also see the nice reverse U shape here. Uh, that means uh, at, for this data augmentation, we, are, uh, we will just have a nice sweet uh, support with the uh, magnitude as 1.00. And another data augmentation function we consider is randomly resized crop, where there is a threshold parameter which, article, which says that uh, how much less uh, 
you can crop out of the image. So that means the lower the threshold is, the more aggressive the data augmentation is. So as we lower the threshold, we can say that also forms a nice reverse U shape. The mutual information decreases, the downstream accuracy first increases and then decreases again. Uh, then the next question is, so the uh, aforementioned examples are just all manually created views. Then the next question, the next question is, given the informing principle and the previous observation, can we have a learning approach to synthesize effective views? So to answer the questions, um, we just recap the two uh, rules of sum of mutual information. The first one is uh, you want to reduce mutual information between two views. And the second rule is that at the same time, you want to want the task relevant uh, information to be intact. So we will start with reducing mutual information between the two views. And how to do that? Actually, the idea is leverage uh, adversarial training. So here in this example, we consider the case of learning a new neural kind of space where the mutual information between two views can be less than any known kind of space at hand. Uh, to make sure what we learned can be called a kind of space, so here we leverage a invertible generator. That means uh, the total information is kept, so you can transfer between two kind of spaces. And at the same time, kind of space is just of the pixel-wise function. So therefore, for this view generator, we restrict it as a pixel-wise function just by using one-by-one -one convolutions. So in that case, we are really learning some pixel-wise transformations, which is both, which is a bijective function, and therefore can be called a neural kind of space. The generated views can be called that. Um, so the idea here to minimize the mutual information between the two views is rather different uh, adversarial training. So for the uh, encoder F1 and F2, we are trying to uh, estimate the INC and maximize it. So it's just trying to maximize the mutual information. At the same time, the view generator is updated by minimizing it. It's a very standard uh, uh, adversarial game, minimax game. Um, uh, Okay, then, but then there are some drawbacks. We observe some drawbacks of this approach. Um, the first thing is that we find the training process is unstable. Um, that says, that in other words, it says, uh, even though we use exam, exactly the same hyperparameter, exactly the same training recipe, we might see different uh, uh, downstream task performance and we, but say the mutual information fluctuate, uh, fluctuate quite a lot. So we conjecture there might be two reasons to cause this problem. The first thing is maybe it's just the, the GAN training so that uh, it's unstable. But the second is uh, we think that it's, uh, it's like when we reduce the mutual information between the two views, uh, the network don't know what should be canceled out between the two views, whether it should be canceling out uh, semantic related information bits, or it should be canceling uh, out uh, uh, nuisance factors. So it, it has no guidance to do that. So to tackle this problem, we try to, to overcome that problem, we try to consider adding a few labeled samples from the downstream task. We are trying to, so what, how do we do this? We are trying to add a classifier classify on top of each view to encourage preserving task relevant information. So this is actually a semi-supervised view learning approach. Just assume you have a head of labels from the downstream task. So inside each batch for unlabeled data, we only perform information minimization using the adversarial training strategy. But for labeled samples, in addition to using the mutual information minimization, we also optimize the generator as the classifier at the same time to predict the label of the downstream task as accurate as possible. So in that way, each view will keep the task relevant information. 
Um, so yes, then after the view, the semi-supervised learning view process have been done, we perform normal unsupervised contrastive learning at uh, linear classification, linear classification evaluation. So here is the results. We consider two different input color space, the RGB and YDBDR. As you can see that uh, the zone RGB and YDBDR space, they have a significant performance gap. YDBDR, you know, the um, prominence and luminous decomposition is way better than the original uh, RGB color space. But after the view learning process, we can see that uh, the view generated from RGB image and the view generated from a wild DBDI image, they perform almost equally well and outper both outperforms the original kind of space. So this is kind of an interesting result to me to show how informing principle can be applied to this example. And I think beyond the kind of space uh, uh, example, maybe in many other scenarios, for example, in data augmentation, we can might leverage a similar approach to, to uh, enhance the data augmentation. But the data augmentation typically is a non-differentiable function. So maybe in that case, we might have to uh, in include some reinforcement there. But I think the general principle is just the, yeah, as you see here. So, okay, those are unsupervised contrastive learning, which are popular these days. But actually, I think the contrastive learning can go beyond just the unsupervised representation learning. And here, I'm going to try to demonstrate two different examples of using contrastive learning in different ways. The first example is supervised contrastive learning. And the reason that actually I like this one is it unifies supervised learning and unsupervised learning in a shared perspective and a, the same loss function. Um, the later is applying the later one is applying contrastive learning in a, in a different application, like the knowledge destination. So, for the supervised contrastive learning, let's recap about uh, for the self-supervised contrastive learning. Um, so, in this example, uh, positive pairs are typically formed by different uh, augmentations of the same image. So, in this example. So in this example, even though the dog in the red box belongs to the same category as the anchor dog here, it is treated as a negative sample and will be put into the denominator of the contrastive noise. Um, but for supervised contrastive learning, uh, because we have the labels now, we can form positive pairs by considering image crops from the same underlying class. So we can try to like, put all kinds of uh, negative uh, all kinds of dogs together to form the positive two pairs and uh, you can have combinatory negative positive pairs over there um this is actually according to our informing principle you have seen in previous slides that is uh, you form you form the views that only have uh, only share the label information of your downstream task so here the downstream task is image classification do you so the two views, like this dog and this dog, what is shared between them is just the label information in the dog. And uh, they don't share the image specific and nuisance factors like the background, which is just uh, the perfect illustration of the views. And uh, so how do we perform this uh, uh, supervised contrastive learning for image classification? Actually, we consider a two-stage training. Uh, firstly, we just perform uh, contrastive learning uh, uh, firstly, and then after that, we freeze the backbone network and we train a linear classifier. Here it's a 1000 category linear classifier on top of it. So that and just train that linear classifier. So you can see that is a separate uh, learning stage, but actually you might consider, you can jointly train the contrastive objective and the cross entropy objective in just a, in a single shot. But that's another story here. The nice thing we see here is that uh, we found that such um, such uh, uh, kind of supervised contrastive learning approach actually outperforms the traditional cross entropy based end to end supervised learning on the well established image net. And given the fact that the image net is kind of saturated at this time, 
So the, uh, the improvement can be considered as a significant. Ac actually, in my personal, uh, personal uh, implementation in PyTorch, I will see more improvement than we put here in this figure. So, um, uh, but uh, also I want to mention one thing here is that if our goal is just to transfer the representation to a downstream task, we don't need to perform the second classification stage here. We just uh, use the representation from the first stage and uh, directly do uh, transfer learning. And uh, there are some nice property of this supervised constructive learning. Uh, the first thing is that actually here we uh, compare between the supervised contrastive learning and cross entropy with a different uh, amount of data. We can see that actually in the low data regime, supervised contrastive learning outperforms cross entropy loss significantly. And uh, uh, another thing is uh, if we perform transfer learning onto the uh, object detection and uh, incidence segmentation task of the COCO data set, we can see that supervised contrastive learning outperforms, uh, not only outperforms uh, uh, this cross entropy counterpart, counterpart, but also outperforms a lot of uh, contrast, unsupervised contrastive learning approaches, which claim to outperform the supervised baseline uh, quite a lot recently. Okay, so now let's move to the second uh, application. So we're trying to, we're, we're trying to think that the uh, contrastive learning just performs the contrastive between the two views of the data X and Y. And actually such views can be very general. So here in this example, uh, we demonstrate how to use it for knowledge destination. So for knowledge destination, um, it's a task of transferring learned knowledge from a big teacher network to a small student network. So in this way, the performance of the student network will be improved. And the traditional methods here, so given image, you fit forward them into teacher and student network, and you extract the feature T and S. So in this case, uh, in traditional methods, uh, people can just uh, regress, use the T as a target, and regress the T using the feature S, and then back propagate all the uh, gradients through the student network to update on the student network but we can think of T and S as different views of the data, like X and Y, and in previous slides, and then we can perform contrastive learning here, actually. So we hope that uh, the teacher and the student representation from the same underlying image should lie close to each other in the representation space, while uh, representation from different images should be set away. The difference from the, uh, the difference in this knowledge destination uh, paper uh, from uh, the previous unsupervised representation learning methods is that the teacher network is just uh, pre-trained and uh, frozen. You never touch it, and you just update the student, student network as well as some projection head, which projects the features into a shared uh, lower dimensional space. And then we perform the task uh, of uh, model compression. So here is the uh, knowledge destination method, which comes from Hinton five years ago. And these are other approaches. Here we just evaluate a single knowledge destination objective without combining other destination objective. So you can see actually no single, interesting, no single destination objective can outperform the original KD objective. But it's using, if you're using a contrastive approach, it outperforms the uh, the previous, uh, all the previous methods. And the nice thing for me for this paper is that it forms a collection between representation learning and uh, knowledge destination. So knowledge destination can be just be as how to learn good representation for student network using the teacher network. So yeah, and uh, okay, so this is the second uh, application. Now um, then let's take a look at some future work. Um, so from the application side, we can apply the constructive learning framework off the shelf on various novel applications. The key is to design meaningful views in a proper way. Like in previous example, you can uh, just uh, use a visual and, uh, um, and audio data as two modality for constructive learning. And I believe there are more applications here, definitely. 
Um, another thing is that we can apply contrastive learning to a different modality. One thing is that we can apply contrastive learning for um, point cloud. We know that self-driving cars running on the road can generate a lot of data, a lot of unlabeled data. So it's very, it's kind of infeasible to label them. So what we can learn from those data might be leveraging contrastive learning approaches. And we can also probably also uh, touch the, uh, we can apply contrastive learning to graph, graph structure data, which is uh, currently less heavily touched. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, a more challenging direction, as I think from the methodology perspective, is to reduce the reliance on large number of negatives. So here is a paper uh, comes out uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. The idea here is to have two different networks, which is kind of similar as uh, the encoder and the momentum encoder in uh, the local paper. So this is this light purple network is a fast network, which is trained with uh, SGD. And the pink network is a slow, slow network, which is the exponential movement average of the online network, the purple one. And uh, during the training process, the fast, net, the fast network is trained. Uh, uh, firstly, during the uh, learning process, for each input image, you will have two different augmentations, and you are fed into the two networks separately to extract the features. And the fast network is trained, trained to regress the target by uh, regress the feature from the snow network. That is using the snow network as a target. So surprisingly, it doesn't, uh, it, it, there is no negative here in this method. And surprisingly, it doesn't collapse. And actually, here is the performance uh, comparison between uh, this approach. This approach, this is a head to head comparison. This approach you can achieve very decent accuracy. Well, you include negatives can only give you a very marginal improvement over this method. So this method is really nice. So it gets rid of negatives. Um, but surprisingly, as I said, it doesn't collapse. So in my opinion, I think that this network is actually secretly doing some negative dispersion. It can be, uh, you, it can, because of multiple reasons, for example, both the online network and the targeted network will use batch normalization to scan the features. And also, the target network is updated very slowly so that uh, the feature distribution uh, from the target uh, network might be somewhat evenly distributed over the uh, latent uh, hyper, uh, unit hypersphere. So that in that case, it will implicitly encourage its feature scattering. So I think in future works, maybe we can have a more explicit normalization just for each batch, and maybe we can even remove the snow network and just use one single network, add one single batch, and we have some, some sort of uh, normalization there to scatter the feature away. Okay, uh, I will end my talk here, and, uh, and I should have a big thank you to all of my co-authors and colleagues over the past year, and they have uh, kind of inspired me a lot of over the, this journey, journey, this unsupervised representation journey. So uh, now I will get back to uh, Chavi, and I will maybe have some, we can have some questions here. Thanks a lot, Yanglong, for, for the great talk. Uh, if anybody wants to ask questions. So, so at, at the beginning of the talk, you made a brief mention to instance level discrimination and how uh, you thought that it was an open chapter in contrastive learning or in supervised learning. Could you develop a bit on that? Sorry? Uh, uh, yeah. So, at uh, so the beginning, you, you, you briefly meant this, uh, talked about instance level discrimination and how it was something that was not like really tackled now in contrastive learning works. I mean, how, how it is uh, expanded? So when, when talking, like you, yeah. you briefly described that, that instance level discrimination. Yeah. 
and how it was like you said that it was an open chapter in unsupervised learning and or basically on like using contrastive learning methods oh i think uh, before that work uh people are just using uh some uh some sort of uh, heuristics like uh, uh predict image rotation or to colorization and uh, that method is i think a breakthrough just a breakthrough uh, of the unsupervised learning approach is just make the contrastive learning just as a single uh, a principle it's like a principled approach uh, actually i think uh, I know the author of that paper and the idea actually dates back to 2016, but uh, they have been, that paper have been rejected quite a, a few times before they get accepted. Um, but I think after that, you can see the performance just increase very dramatically and uh, uh, just like, it's just like a game changing paper and people start to look at the contrastive learning approach. So I think that is even earlier than the Contrastive, contrastive approaches from the NLP side, like the BERT and, uh, uh, and uh, the on it. I think BERT and Tyonet it is kind of sort of, of a contrastive learning approach as well. I see, thank you. And, and the second question is, uh, it seems that cons contrastive approaches for supervised learning like work better even in the context of like full data. But if, if you have the labels, it's, it's not clear to me like intuitively what information are you getting uh, by maximizing modal information that you wouldn't get by like using some cross entropy loss? Could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, so. Actually, in my opinion, uh, I think just the uh, cross entropy training is also a contrastive learning approach. I can, if you think of the x and the x is the data and y is the label as the two views of the data. And then you use a network to embed the X. And for the Y, you can also, you will use some classifier way to Y zero, right? The W, w multiply feature plus BIOS in the last linear classifier the year. Actually, that W can be sort of as the lookup table for each label Y. And then that then can supervise the cross entropy learning can be sort of as contrastive learning. But I think that here, why can supervise contrastive learning is uh, better is uh, from the information perspective, I have no idea because uh, uh, cross entropy loss can be also sort of as maximize uh, uh, the information, maximize the uh, log likelihood uh, who do you have uh, the, of the Y given the data. But uh, so I don't have a, a, a theoretical in, intuition about that, but my guess is that uh, um, contrast, from the practical side, my guess is that contrastive learning is uh, leveraging uh, the relationships between data points. Well, in cross entropy learning, each data point is treated uh, independently. You don't model the relationship between data points. And so you don't model the distance between the data points. So uh, to that perspective, I think, uh, uh, contrastive learning might be better. Another hint is that contrastive learning seems to be more hungry about data augmentation. So in other words, for contrastive learning, you might be able to apply heavier data augmentation and say improvement. But for cross entropy based learning, if you apply heavier data augmentation, you might not be able to say improvement. Yeah. Thank you. If anyone else has questions, feel free to unmute. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, thanks a lot, uh, Yonglong, for, for your great talk. It was a pleasure.